Today, I want to open up with a pretty special commentary from the scholar F.F. Bruce. Those Gentiles who went all the way in the direction of Judaism, but stopped short of circumcision, were treated as God-fears, okay? God-fears still outside the fellowship and not admitted as proselytes to membership within it. So look at this. He acknowledges two specific classifications of Gentiles, both identify with the Jewish faith. You got God fears on one hand, proselytes on the other. What is the difference? Well, see, understand something. Both of them, God fears and proselytes, they both identify with the Jewish faith. They both go out and confess there's no other God but the God of Israel. They'll go through a mikvah. They'll even go through a mikvah. But that is where the God fear stops. The only difference between the God fear and the proselyte, circumcision. And so when you look at God fears, when you look at proselytes, what you really should be seeing with the God fears, you have a limited membership status. The proselyte has full membership status. A God fear is not family. They're not within the Jewish fellowship. They won't be intermarrying amongst Israel. They won't be allowed to keep the festivals like Passover. They're going to be prohibited from celebrating the Pesach, something that's so powerful for us today. No, they can't do that. In fact, I'll take it as far as say, guess what? They can't eat at all with the Jewish people. In fact, you know, this is one of the things that I was mentioning the other week. In regard to Peter, one of these marvels when, when, when he sees the sheet come down three times and the Lord commands him, go to these uncircumcised men. And Peter goes to Cornelius, he obeys the Lord. He goes to Cornelius, but you remember one of the first things that came out of his mouth, one of the first things that came out of his mouth was this. Then he said to him, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. This isn't kosher, Cornelius. What you see happening, there's a wall between us. You're uncircumcised. I am the circumcised. This is not lawful. This doesn't happen. You're excluded. See, that's the thing about God fears. They have, they're excluded from the benefits of full membership. Cornelius in the first century he is the very definition of a god fear. He was a god fear. Understand that. Go back and read the text in Acts chapter 10. You'll find that he had an amazing reputation amongst all those in Israel. They loved him. He loved them. Oh, and guess what? He called upon the God of Israel and he prayed to him only. In fact, the only reason Peter was at his door is because the Lord answered his prayer. And this is controversial. We know what, what Peter did here was not accepted. If you remember, I told you, see, Peter went up to Jerusalem. And guess what? His, his friends, his Jewish friends caught wind of what he did. And how did they respond? Well, let's look at this. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and you ate with them. What are you doing? This is not allowed. They have no access into our realm, into our family. Our family does not mix with the uncircumcised. A proselyte is not at all treated like that. A proselyte has full membership status. All the promises, all the covenants, everything is afforded to them. They are not excluded from Passover. They celebrate the Passover. They're not excluded from eating with their fellow brethren, their fellow Jewish brethren. In fact, the Torah goes as far as to say, that a proselyte, a Gentile, who goes through this full conversion, they receive the circumcision, they're an Ezrach, an Ezrach, a natural born citizen. With that said, let's break into this. Galatians chapter two, verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, now this is important, right? This is where it all started. All the controversy in regard to what did we do with the Gentiles who were coming into the faith? Do they have to be circumcised? And Paul and Barnabas stood and said, no. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face 
because he was to be blamed. Two of the most influential men that ever walked on planet Earth, going toe to toe. The Apostle Paul having to go and correct his brother. Unthinkable. Peter was the guy that Yeshua said, behold, to you I give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Peter was the guy that Yeshua said, you're gonna sit on a throne judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Peter was the guy, only one of three, who was chosen to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration and literally be able to see Yeshua in a glorified state. Oh, with Moses and Elijah, Peter saw that. Peter was the guy who walked on water. Peter was the guy who people were running to get into his shadow so that they could be healed. Think about what Paul just dropped on the Galatians and the weight they would have felt. They knew who Peter was. He knows the impact that this is. This is a shock to the system, this story. And him telling them, hey, I had to come onto the scene. And I want to be clear on something. The Lord was wise because Not just anybody can go and correct Peter. That's not going to happen. You needed a man that like the Apostle Paul who had such an anointing that garments were taken from his body and brought to other people and they were healed. Supernaturally, devils would fly out of people because the anointing that was on Paul. And don't forget, Paul also raised the dead. That's the anointing. This is the kind of guy that had to come to deal with it. Now, imagine if you're the Galatians. And you're reading this and you know who Peter is. Everyone in the kingdom who's a believer knows who Peter is. This is a guy that would be talked about behind closed doors of the magnitude of the things that the Lord was doing through him. It was awesome. And so the fact that he's laying this story on them is to rock their world. Flip them upside down. You're listening. You need to be, not that they probably weren't before after he chastised them so bad. They probably got their attention, but then you throw this story in and it gets really, really intense. We need to put something into context before we continue. Peter, we just read it in Acts 11. What happened to Peter when he was hanging out with the uncircumcised? How'd that go? Not well. He got ripped. They chastised him as soon as he got to Jerusalem. They were all over him. Remember that when we continue as we read on here to see why he was to be blamed. What did Peter do? For before certain men came from James. Where is James? Oh, he's in Jerusalem. The very same people who rebuked Peter. In Acts chapter 11, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. The first thing I want you to recognize here, and this is the most critical part, Peter's own personal conviction, he had no reservation whatsoever about identifying these uncircumcised Gentiles as individuals that had full membership status. They were family. Peter's own personal conviction and what he knew to be true was he understood what God had done with them, how they had been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. They bore the seal of the righteousness of the faith. No reservation whatsoever, sitting down and eating with them. So what happened? Peter got scared, right? What does it say here at the end? He feared those who were of the circumcision. And you may think about it. I mean, you can, we, we can speculate all day long, but knowing the history here, knowing what happened in Acts chapter 10, understanding what happened as you turn into the Acts chapter 11 and the grilling that Peter received because he went and ate with them, on, on a level, I can appreciate why Peter did this. Do I really want to go through this again? Do I really want to cause and stir all this controversy? Might just be easier to quietly remove myself. Unfortunately, Peter withdrawing from the Gentiles was a tragedy. It was a tragedy on an epic level because what did Yeshua do? As he's doing this new thing, Yeshua, you read Ephesians 2, Yeshua broke down a middle wall of separation. And in the text, go and read it, and we'll be covering it later in more detail. 
But the text is very clear. He took two men, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. He created one new man. Think about that. That needs to resonate in your heart. You're going to understand this whole series. You have to understand what Yeshua really did by tearing down this middle wall of separation to make Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised, one new man in him. Now that's really, really powerful. But here we have a situation Peter withdraws. <laughs> Isn't it just like the devil? See, with all the beautiful work that Yeshua goes out and does that is holy, righteous, pure, it's true, the devil will come in to destroy it. And the wall that he tore down, the devil's coming in to build back up. Hey there, this is Mike at Corner Fringe Ministries. Thanks for watching our video. If you liked the video or it encouraged you, do us a favor, hit the like button, don't forget to hit the share, and if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button. Now, if you wanna watch the rest of this video, hit the button here. And if you wanna watch the rest of this series, you can check it out here. And don't forget, you can download the Corner Fringe Ministries app today on any of your Play Stores. Thanks for joining us at Corner Fringe Ministries.